My name is Tom Farr. I'm a senior fellow at the Berkeley Center and the director of the Religious Freedom Project, which is sponsoring this event. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Eric Patterson in just a moment, but I wanted to mention this project to you. We're very excited about it. It's just started, and I'll mention a public event that we're going to have on November 17th, which will, be, uh, which will feature a keynote debate between two of the most important legal scholars in the United States, Noah Feldman of Harvard Law School and Michael McConnell of Stanford Law School, who will debate the question of uh, what's so special about religious freedom. What is it grounded in? Is it a derivative right? Does it stand on its own? We're excited about that. We'll also have a couple of panels featuring our own scholars. Um, Mona Siddiqui of uh, the University of Glasgow, for example. Um, we'll have uh, Will Inboden and uh, Dan Philpot and others. So please come and join us. John Finnis will be here uh, from Notre Dame Law School and from Oxford. Uh, we have put in the seats a pamphlet which describes the Religious Freedom Project to you, so please take it with you and join with us uh, as we move forward over the next several years, having uh, a series of very exciting events, uh, not the least of which is this one. We are delighted uh, to present to you uh, this event concerning, as far as I'm concerned, one of the most important books that has come out in recent years. So, Eric, over to you. Thanks, Tom. This book, The Price of Freedom Denied, will be the centerpiece of our conversation this morning. Uh, before we go to that, let me welcome you to the Berkeley Center. I'm Eric Patterson, one of our associate directors here at the Center, and I teach on religion and conflict and the ethics of war, largely. And this book, actually, actually 2011, is a banner year for thinking on the issues where religious factors intersect with global politics. Uh, in fact, this center has published three books in 2011 on these topics. The first by our center director, Tom Banchoff, called Embryo Politics, and it's about precisely what the title talks about, the ethical and legal debates on both sides of the Atlantic surrounding embryonic stem cell research. A second book uh, by RFP scholar, Tim Shaw and two co-authors called God's Century, which looks at the global resurgence of religion, not just employing a descriptive frame of analysis, but helping us to understand what that means in 2011 and beyond. And then a third book that came out on October 1st, and I, it's a little bit of self-promotion, my own book, uh, called, uh, with a subtitle, Towards a Religiously Literate U.S. Foreign Policy. In other words, it's called Politics in a Religious World, and it's about how U.S. foreign policy can do a better job of apprehending and dealing with the religious multidimensionality of the world that we live in. And so this book, The Price of Freedom Denied, is in good company. A, a great amount of thinking over the past five years has gone into how do we understand the religious variables that are part of contemporary global affairs. This book is particularly relevant. We've heard for a long time about issues of religious persecution, but what we haven't had is strong social science research on how that very compelling human rights issue connects to a much wider universe of other issues. Our authors today, Brian Grimm from the Pew Trust here in DC, and Roger Fink from the uh, Pennsylvania State University, are friends of the center. We've hosted them here before, uh, but perhaps never before under such auspicious uh, moment as this book. So I'd like to turn it over to them after we hear from them, there'll be a response from uh, Georgetown sociologist Jose Casanova, and then we'll open it up to questions and answers. Thank you for being here. Roger, Brian. Yeah, well, thank you. It's uh, good to be good to be here, and, uh, and it's always a relief when a big project gets done. So Eric was asking me before, uh, at the beginning, what's next? Uh, well, Roger will end with a slide that talks about what's next, so I'll save that for the end. Um, this, uh, just in case you're wondering, the, the Arabic, uh, the nation is to all the people. Uh, is There we go. 
you know. Uh, this is a picture of a protest by an organization called Kafir Enough uh, back in 2006 after some attacks on Coptic churches in Egypt, in Alexandria. And uh, so we chose that as the picture. Also, Jose just pointed out that uh, the cops are on the front page of the uh, Washington Post this morning. So these issues that we talk about, though, uh, you know, any book or piece of research is dated and, you know, looks at a time period. Uh, part of what we've tried to do in this book is to look at trends and how these trends uh, are uh, occurring over time. Uh, a little bit about the project itself. Um, for oh, about 20 years, I worked in the Middle East, uh, Europe, Soviet Central Asia, and Western China in Xinjiang. And uh, for all those years, I was looking at the different configurations of church and state, religion and state, very different situations in the places I was working. And the last spot I was at was in the United Arab Emirates. Um, I was an academic coordinator at their military academy. And at that time, I came across a book by uh, Roger uh, Finke and uh, Rodney Stark called F uh, Acts of Faith. And then they have another book, but it was their book, Acts of Faith, that I found most compelling, that it was a, a book using a religious economy's model or perspective on ways to understand religious dynamics in the world. And uh, my kids were getting ready to come back to college at that time, and I thought, well, why don't I go back to college and, uh, uh, and it, it do a PhD on this topic? And, you know, I had a dream of writing a book with Roger. I didn't say that when I came, but it, it came true. So. Uh, it, it's, it, it, I think the, the, that's how the project gets started, uh, and I could talk a lot more on that, but I, I won't. Um, but its impact has, has been substantial, uh, not just in terms of having a book produced, but then uh, for the past six years I've been working at the Pew Research Center, and we adopted the methodology that was developed into trying to calculate annual indexes on these measures. Uh, and then just this year from our report, which came out in August, I've been invited to speak at the British Parliament on this topic, uh, did a uh, video interview for the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff that will be distributed among the military. So, I mean, just as an indication of the impact of the r research that this, that this really that's embodied in the book has had and I think continues to make. And then again, all the data are available at the ARDA, and maybe Roger will say a word or two about the ARDA when, when he comes up. So they're thinking of violent religious persecution, which is a form of social conflict and a form of religious violence. And we, we think of it very broadly. It also includes religion, uh, the victims of religion-related terrorism and even religion-related war, where you have a clear element of religion-related related war. Um, what are, what are some of the things that are, go into that? Well, there's many possible things. It could be pluralism. It could be explained by Huntington's civilizations that, you know, people of different religions are just fighting each other all the time. Or some religions themselves may have a propensity to more violence than others. Um, uh, there's many d different explanations. It could just be a demographic bubble going through society and people uh, have grievances, the economy's bad, and, and, and then they take out their frustrations on religious minorities. So there's many possible explanations uh, for violent religious per persecution, but the one that uh, we've tried to test is from the religious economy's perspective that when you regulate religion, either from forces within society or particularly from governments, that that sets up uh, imbalances if you have high regulations and that can lead to violence. So um, Roger will be talking more about the theory that goes into this and then our actual statistical test. This is just a theoretical model. Um, but I thought I would begin with some examples uh, that help you get an idea of what, what we're thinking about when we say that uh, particularly government or social restrictions on relig religion can lead to violence. So this is, uh, I have, I, I pulled some, th these aren't in the book because these are more recent things that happened, but they're, they're examples of what we talk about in the book. Uh, just uh, in the past several years, the um, 
Muslim Council in Indonesia has issued a fatwa saying that Ahmadiyya uh, believers are not Orthodox Muslims, and therefore they can't propagate their faith, they can't call themselves Muslims. Uh, they're, they're really considered a, an unorthodox, haram, bad sect. Uh, after that fatwa was passed, there was a series of, uh, of social movements in the country that burned Ahmadiyya mosques and, and uh, attacked Ahmadiyya people. And one of them was caught on film by Al Jazeera, uh, which I, I won't show you because it's rather graphic, but uh, in one community uh, they, they attacked the Ahmadiyya uh, believers. The police stood by and watched as three were stripped naked and beaten to death. Uh, so uh, here we see some direct connection between laws and uh, by a, a government approved uh, association saying that this sect is evil or bad or unorthodox and then persecution that results from it, violent persecution. Um, uh, other examples that some of you may be familiar with that happened this, just this year uh, in Pakistan, uh, Salman Taser, who was the uh, Pakistan's uh, the um, pro the uh, governor of Punjab and probably one of the highest level uh, uh, di uh, government officials in, in Pakistan in the high tier uh, was assassinated merely because he wanted to protect this woman, a Christian woman who was accused of blasphemy. So there's a blasphemy law, very strict blasphemy law that if you uh, speak out against Islam in, in Pakistan that the penalty for that can be death. The government has never, pa ha has never carried out such a sentence, but it's on the books. And then when th these laws are there, people who are considered blasphemers are often killed by mobs, uh, mob violence. Uh, he was assassinated merely for suggesting that this law should be repealed. Uh, similarly, then later in March, that was in January and March, uh, the uh, Pakistan's Minister for Minority Affairs, Shabazz Bhatti, was gunned down in, uh, in his driveway before he was going to work, uh, also because he was speaking out against this law. So laws on the books and someone who might take a step to uh, outside of what the law is or suggest we change that law can result in direct uh, religion-related violence or persecution. Um, in India, in, in, uh, there are a series of anti-conversion laws that have been set up in a number of Indian states uh, with the purpose of saying that you shouldn't convert anyone because uh, using any allurement or trying to sort of buy a conversion, so to speak. Uh, on the surface, that seems like a, a reasonable law that if you want to proselytize or share your faith with someone, uh, you know, it's wrong to pay them to convert or uh, allure them uh, for some physical gain or material gain. Uh, but the, the National Commission for Minorities looked into some of the, the practice of these laws and what they found was that when these laws are in place, then uh, mobs will often drag people either before the court or beat them, kill them, uh, because they say, well, you're, you're, you know, you've proselytized or you've preached something that I don't like. And uh, so they use these laws as a pretext for then going after uh, religious minorities. Uh, so again, a connection between uh, restrictions on religion, which may seem reasonable to many because it can protect, it seems to protect uh, Ill, um, protect unethical types of religious behavior, but instead that law that's on the books in the end uh, can trigger these cycles of violence. Um, probably one of the more complex and, and, and becoming well, more well-known cycles of religion-related violence is in Xinjiang, uh, Western China, where two of my kids were born, by the way. Uh, in in uh, Urumqi, this is a, a picture of uh, police um, hauling out a Uyghur Muslim who they suspected as being part of the violence that was happening back in 2009. Uh, but this 10-minute video uh, is, uh, provides, if you want to watch it, I have the, the address down here, but you can see that the uh, effect of the police saying that this, these Muslims are 
bad, we suspect them of something, and the direct social response and how that triggers additional beatings. So going down the street, these men in the left on the, in the white who were not police uh, had sticks, and as the police were going down, the, the, the people from society were beating, <laughs> beating the men, the police were there. So this idea that you target a minority as being criminal or being wrong just in, in some ways just for being a minority, then justifies the idea that this religious group is, is dangerous and it's okay to whack them, uh, literally to, to whack them. Uh, so these are the kind of uh, theories that Roger will talk about in a few minutes. Some of the uh, reasons that we see the stacking up of a law after law that restricts religious freedom uh, being associated with religion-related violence. Um, I'm borrowing something from our Pew research here, but uh, we've been looking at changes in both government restrictions and social hostilities over time. And uh, coming across the page to the right are government restrictions, higher government restrictions. China has high government restrictions in religion. And going up the page are high social hostilities involving religion. So India has high social hostilities, communal violence, uh, terrorism is happening in the country, not always by their own citizens, but all these things tend to raise the level of social hostilities involving religion. But the Chinese f concept is that if we keep pressure on religion uh, tightly, that we can control the negative side, hostilities involving religion, um, because that's the danger zone. Once you start entering here, you could call it a danger zone. This is where restrictions are most intense where you have high government restrictions and high social hostilities involving religion. Well, in recent years, China has moved from having low hostilities to having a more uh, elevated or moderate level of social hostilities involving religion. I just spoke at an event at uh, the Kissinger Institute on U.S. and China, and uh, I was talking to some of the Chinese scholars who were there, and they said, well, you know, off the record, uh, Chinese people hate the Uyghurs. They just hate them. Uh, of course, having lived there, I know that. Uh, but uh, for them to say that, so these hostilities, uh, you know, the, the Uyghurs have been demonized as the problem, and then that sets up the justification that they are a problem, and then the possibility of more violence happening uh, becomes greater. Uh, this is in our book, which we have a few copies if anybody would uh, like one for purchase or they're available on Amazon. Um, but uh, we, we looked at this same, I'm sorry, the same scatter plot that you see here, and countries fall into some different types of categories, uh, and any typology has problems, so we don't try to defend this as being definitive in any way, but at least you can observe some commonalities. So where China is and Vietnam on that chart, the, that, the chart from Pew just had the 25 most populous countries. Um, but here you can see re religion is a political threat. That's how China and Vietnam often treat religion. In countries like Bangladesh, Egypt, and Pakistan, where you have high government restrictions and high social hostilities, um, it's something like a socio-political monopoly, so that there's a religious group trying to dominate the religious life of a country, and it's done so to such an extent that it also affects the politics. Uh, India, uh, Indonesia, Russia, more monopolistic social pressures, but it hasn't gone all the way to being a political domination by religion uh, in, the, in those areas. And then many European countries fall in this power partitioned between religion and state category, where you can see um, some accommodation between uh, religion and state, such as in Germany, where you have a large Catholic community, a large Protestant community, growing Muslim community, and the state has somehow tried to work out these relations uh, among them. And then uh, on the bottom left-hand corner, countries uh, like Brazil and the Philippines and Japan having generally low government restrictions and just some tensions involving religion. And one thing to note is that there's no countries that are high on government restrictions, but, uh, I'm sorry, low on government restrictions and high on social hostilities. Uh, so that section of the chart just has no countries whatsoever. Um, now, 
if I take all the data from all the different countries and sort of aggregate it at the regional level, there's a clear correlation between coming across the bottom legal and policy restrictions involving religion and religion-related violence. Uh, so the higher the legal and policy restrictions, the higher the level of violence on religion. Now that could just be that the violence starts and, and then governments say, well, let's control it through regulations. Or it could be that the regulations are triggering the violence. This is just a correlation. So to sort that out, I'm going to let my colleague, uh, <laughs> Professor Finke, uh, talk on that topic. Well, first of all, I, I want to thank the people at the Berkeley Center for, for having us. Um, one of the things I'm really looking forward to is, is uh, getting feedback from Jose, but also every one of you here. Uh, it's going to be extremely valuable because I think it's often said that books are never completed, they're simply abandoned. And I think we know there's a much bigger research project out there still. So uh, we really view this as, as you know, a, we consider it a major step, but it's only a step in, in progress in this area. Um, also, um, Brian has emphasized, uh, you know, some of the, the different events and the data, but I want to stress that the data which were collected, um, which were collected by Brian and others when Brian was affiliated with the Association of Religion Data Archive, these were, uh, I think, probably the first major collection which had both information on the restrictions placed on religion, but also on religious persecution and other forms of violence. And so it's really a major step forward. And I also want to thank those who put the International Religious Freedom Reports together, because it's a major source of information. Uh, so it's, it's a time where we really have what I would consider the, the most objective measures we could possibly get, coded in a way that was really effective. And so I really think when we're talking about these different data, uh, it's by far the best that's out there. Um, and then the great thing about it, too, is it's not simply inflated or deflated by the ability to have, uh, for the press to have access to information. So it goes well beyond that. Now, as Brian said, I want to talk some about the, the theoretical background of this, what, what Brian and I developed as arguments here. And uh, surprisingly, social science theory has had uh, relatively little to say about religion's unique role in social conflicts around the globe, uh, yet, even though this is the very time when uh, many of the conflicts seem to be fueled by religion. Uh, one of the, the most notable exceptions, however, obviously is Huntington's clash of civilizations. More recently, as Eric was saying, there's a number of other conversations that are, are being generated now that are, are coming up which are very, very helpful, but Huntington's the one that everybody has to be in conversation with. And with Huntington, I don't think I need to review his argument in any detail at all, but one of the things, obviously, he argued that cultural and cultural identities are shaping conflict in the post-Cold World War, or post -cold, Cold War world, and that these cultural identities are civilizations, and that typically they're identified with the world's great religions. As a result, conflicts result when there's a clash between these major civilizations. The implication being um, that religious pluralism, in particular religious pluralism where you have religions from different, uh, of these major different world religions, can result in conflict. So Huntington was clearly pointing to the potential dangers of this different forms of pluralism. And when he talked about uh, civilization clashes, he talked about it at two levels. One was across countries and regions. The second one was those divides or those gaps within a country. And those are the ones that Brian and I are most interested in, is looking at those civilization fault lines within, within a country. Now, where they were, he emphasized the potential danger of pluralism. A contrast to that would be the work of Voltaire, Smith, and Hume, where they all said that pluralism was the very thing that could bring peace. And obviously, they were writing at a very different time. Uh, Voltaire, as always, puts it very, in very uh, clear terms. He says, if there were only one religion, there would be danger of despotism. If there were two, they would cut each other's throats, but there are 30, and they live in peace and happiness. Okay. Uh, Jefferson made similar comments. Jefferson also made the initial note that the way to silence religious disputes is to take no notice of them. But clearly here the emphasis is on the benefits of having multiple religions so no one religion can dominate or so no two or three are as far as are uh, in, uh, opposing each other. Now our thesis, um, and that is to the extent that government or social forces deny religious freedoms or regulate religion as the way we refer to it, religious conflict will increase. Now in other words, what we're saying in contrast to these first two arguments is it isn't religious pluralism that either causes or eliminates conflict, 
It's the response to the pluralism. And in particular, what we emphasize is to what extent are freedoms granted? Or to put it another way, to what extent are there attempts to prevent this form of pluralism? And that's where we feel is, is really at the heart of how do you want to understand this issue. Now, this argument comes out of a much larger religious economies model. Uh, in the past, as Brian was saying, he read uh, the book I did with Rod Stark, Acts of Faith. We emphasized the importance of regulation there. But we were trying to look at how the role regulation had on the supply of religions. And a basic thesis is that regulating religion restricts the supply of religion by changing the incentives and opportunities for religious producers, or religious leaders and organizations, and consumers, so the organizational members. Now, what we stressed here is that whenever you put restrictions on a group, or you simply do not allow them to exist at all above ground, is it in increases the cost for entering the market, the religious marketplace, and it also increases the operating cost once after you exist. So it can be anything as from r making it very hard to be get registered to once after you are officially accepted and registered to having all sorts of restrictions on how you operate. And we said that this is very important for understanding as far as to the extent that there are, uh, that it reduces the opportunities for these new groups that enter markets. But likewise for the, the members. For the members, they face it harder because they can face, one, restrictions personally as far as, two, if it's not the favored religion, they have to pay money to the organization as well as still pay taxes to the government supporting one religion. So it becomes far more costly for them as far as to follow these minority religions. Uh, so the costs are especially high for minority religions. The thing that consistently happens over and over again, it is the minority religions which bear the brunt of the burden in almost all, not all, but almost all of these cases. And I should add too, with this model, um, you can see this play out. Uh, Tony Gill, uh, Andrew Chestnut, and others have, have shown how it's played out in South America why the evangelicals came to, to, to rise and why you had more groups arising as, as re regulations were reduced. You can see this very briefly in Russia as far as when, when the restrictions were dro adopt, or dropped. And then also, um, I'm not sure how to pronounce his first name, Young, Young Feng Lu uh, looked at it in Taiwan in 1989 when they had the uh, law of civic organizations which really opened it up. And he, as far as then pointed out, as far as there was like a twofold increase in the number of different religious groups, or no, I guess it was a 12-fold increase and a twofold increase in the number of different temples and other religious organizations that arose. So this has been looked at in a, in a number of different locations. Now with this, one of the key things we need to understand are the motives for denying religious freedoms. You know, why do the states deny the religious freedoms? Well, there's a number of different factors, but one of them would be alliances are needed for stability and legitimacy. Tony Gill has just recently written a book on this. Actually, it's in the same series as the book Brian and I are in, as far as on when the it's in the state's interest to have an alliance with a religion and to regulate other religions. And usually, it's not their idea to regulate the other religions. It's the, the religion they're in alliance with. A second one is to control religious organizations and movements. As Brian was pointing out in the case of China, this is often the goal there as far as to control the movements. As a, as a member of Religious Affairs Bureau mentioned to me once, he said, it's not that we think atheism works. We know atheism doesn't work, but we feel that religion has to be c uh, controlled because it will be a threat. It will be a threat. In most cases, they will refer to public order in many cases. And finally, the majority's fear of religious minorities. And here, this can ha occur at many different levels in many countries for different reasons. Sometimes it's simply for votes. Um, when the majority often fears these minorities, I mean, minorities are a great threat. Some of you are old enough to remember the anti-cult movement in the United States, as far as how many cults were viewed as tremendous threat here. That has just been expanded into an exponent as far as in Europe over the last 20 years. So it can be a real threat for the state as well. Beyond the state, there's also religious and social motives. One is the big one is simply to reduce or eliminate religious competition. Uh, and this one comes mostly from other religions. A second one is it's a challenge to historical or cultural identity. Uh, perhaps this is most evident in, in Russia right now, where they view th many of these cults, these other cults and sects, as being as threatening the very core of their culture. Um, and then finally, again, you have the majority's fear of religious minorities. Um, these minority groups are often 
feared to be very dangerous. So why do religious freedoms pers uh, reduce persecution by the state? Well, one is simply there's no single religion has access to the power and privileges of the state. It takes, it, if you go back to the U.S. Uh, or the colonies when they were first, the Constitution or the amendments really being, first being formed, those, the rationalists wanted religion out of the state's arena and the state wanted religion out of their arena. Essentially, it was, a, it was a decision to divide those two arenas up. And so there's freedoms for all religions, but power for none. And the state will also have less authority and incentive to persecute religion. They'll have less authority because they're forced as far as, or if not forced, but they're expected to endorse and promote and, and s protect religious freedoms. They'll have less incentive because they're no longer in an alliance with a dominant religion. And finally, the tyranny of the majority is tamed. I think there's a natural tendency for us to say democracy, freedom of elections, will somehow result in all freedoms being acknowledged and recognized. But that's not the case because the tyranny of the majorities that Tocqueville and many others have warned as far as the majority often does not so want to support the rights or the freedoms of minorities. Now beyond the state, why do religious freedoms reduce religious and social conflicts? Well, the freedoms of the minority are the freedoms of the majority. Uh, some of you might remember, I hope you all remember Andrew Greeley. He was a highly published uh, sociologist. He was a Catholic priest. He also wrote many novels, which I finally read one of them. I got my courage up and read one of them. But Andrew Greeley, you know, it's said about some, there's no thought unpublished. I think Andrew would concede he had a few publications that were never thoughts. Uh, <laughs> but I, I greatly admire him, like many things. But one of the most memorable lines he, he put was in that fine social science journal called TV Guide. Uh, and in TV Guide, this opening line was something to the effect of, I don't much like TV evangelists. I don't like their theology, and I don't like their style but their freedoms are my freedoms. And that really summarized as far as one of the reasons as far as why, what, what religious freedoms help to diffuse. When you recognize that their freedoms are your freedoms, it's much more likely to diffuse this. Uh, when I was in Dearborn this, uh, two, three years ago, was interviewing a mom, he told me the same thing about uh, many Christian pastors. When they came to his defense to be able to purchase property in a, in a strip mall, he said the thing they told me was your freedoms are also our freedoms, and so we want to protect yours as well. And so I think that's one of the reasons it helps to diffuse it. Another one is the vigilante policing actions are less tolerated, okay? You can no longer allow these things to exist. One of the examples we use in the book, or, or comparisons we use in the book, is comparing this even to race relations in the United States as far as before freedoms were, were enforced. Before those freedoms were enforced, you still had a lot of vigilante activities going on. And finally, this is one that Brian and I did not have time to get to the book. I've done a little work on it since, is that, well, I think we, we certainly suggest this, but we didn't have time to develop it, is that social isolation and discrimina discrimination resulting from restrictions are reduced. Um, one of the, at the heart of many social conflict models is when you have discrimination, you have social isolation that reduces contact between groups, it increases the probability of there being conflict. So I think that's a very crucial one. So how do we test this? And I mentioned, I really think that this is the best source of data we have. This is pretty much takes the model that Brian had uh, earlier and puts it to the test here. Now, as you can see, the three once the three variables we emphasize the most are dependent variable, religious persecution is what we want to explain, but then social and government regulation. One of the things I want to stress is if you look at uh, civilization divide, when we had a simpler model, civilization of the divide had a, a direct relationship with religious persecution. Once we controlled for other variables, however, that relationship went away. The point, again, being is as far as the civilization divides do lead to a call for more restrictions. We, in no way do we want to divide, uh, deny that, but as far as what is the result of that? And it's something which it leads for a call to, to more restrictions, and then more restrictions lead to both social regulation as well as government restrictions as well. With this model, too, and Brian can certainly say more about the model if you have questions, but is this is the best fitting model However, the models would also work if we had social regulation having an impact on religious persecution. 
And in some of the later models that were run as far as looking at other forms of, of violence, uh, social regulation even has a, a stronger impact than government regulation. But again, it's the regulations have the really powerful impact. So if we revisit the original thesis, even when numerous controls are entering, entered, religious persecution increases when religious freedoms are denied, whether they be through social means or through government means. And again, it isn't religious pluralism that causes or eliminates religious persecution. It is the response to the pluralism, the denial of freedoms, or as I mentioned earlier, the attempt to prevent pluralism by denying certain freedoms. So where do we go from here? Well, you know, I think both Brian and I could go on and on about this, where we could go from here. But here's a few that we want to identify first, is expanding on how religious freedoms are ensured. I had a colleague who said after reading this, he said, yeah, but you make it sound so simple. All you have to do is ensure religious freedoms, and then it will reduce conflict. And I says, all you have to do, you know? Uh, yeah, right. So uh, yeah, the first one is understanding how religious freedoms are ensured. One of the things I'm very interested in right now personally is looking at independent judiciaries. You know, uh, rather than simply looking at uh, Islamic courts, but looking at independent judiciaries and to affect their, uh, to, to the extent that they are effective judiciaries as well, too. Um, also want to expand the argument to other forms of conflict. Uh, Brian and I did religious persecution because we, one, felt this was really a critical question that had to be addressed, and, and the other thing, you only address so much at one time. But uh, there are other measures in the data file, such as religion-related violence. There's all sorts of measures as far as on violence as a whole. Um, and so it really, the ex argument needs to be expanded in some of those areas. A third one, which is really, it has a wide ranging in terms of the way it could be covered, is better understanding the relationship between religious freedoms and other freedoms. Now, some of these relationships are obvious. Okay, uh, religious expression is obviously closely related to freedom of speech. Uh, the ability to gather in a public place to worship is obviously closely related to freedom to assemble. So there clearly are some relationships, but as we put out in the book, the relationships are quite strong, even in some areas that might not appear to be as closely related. And we really need to better understand how all of these freedoms are related, and I think to take it from just having sort of little islands of study on all these different special interest groups to better understanding how these freedoms are related and what factors contribute to all of them. For example, I think one of the things we need to look at, again, is things like independent judiciary, free elections, a variety of things could be looked at. Now, to take this closer to home, I um, want to look at religious freedom that even in our country, religious freedoms are very inconvenient and they're very fragile. Uh, far more fragile and far, well, maybe inconvenience obvious, but fragile is not always obvious. Uh, this was the initial 9-11 response, later responses, but we don't want to, I don't want to oversimplify what's going on here, but a couple examples with the United States. Um, during the Smith versus Oregon decision in 1990, uh, when many people felt that it was really uh, uh, restricting or, or uh, as far as limiting compelling interest tests. Michael McConnell was one of those people who wrote extensively on this. Um, uh, John Y. Brannick and I collected data on this and found that in fact just that one decision made substantial difference in the number of favorable decisions that resulted and also in the number of court cases that were brought forward by, by minority religions. Once you know or you perceive the probability of success is less, fewer cases are brought forward. So another one that Brian and I cited in the book was the First Amendment Center. When they did their, uh, they asked people if others should have the freedom to worship as one chooses. In 2000, 73% agreed with this. In 2007, it dropped down to 56%. The point being in each of these cases is while we all believe so strongly in these freedoms, many things can happen where those freedoms and this, the support for those freedoms really changes. The one thing that, that Brian and I do feel very strongly about is that we do feel and very convinced that the price of freedom denied is, is high indeed. So, thank you. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here and to have the opportunity to uh, present a few critical comments on a very, very important book. This is a great, great uh, uh, book that anybody who, of course, 
cares for the freedoms of everybody, everywhere, obviously should, should take this book very, very seriously. And this is what this book is all about, about the need to simply defend the freedoms of every individual everywhere in the world. And obviously, this is something which is very close to my heart and, 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 and in this respect. Um, I have a series of uh, critical comments. I think the thesis itself is inexpugnable in the sense that, uh, let me... Uh, Our first thesis, to the extent that government deny religious freedoms, physical religious persecution and conflict will increase. Of course, I would argue anybody who has studied authoritarian regimes and has worked for democratization and the rule of law has known that for a long, long time. So I have in this respect, since this is something which I've done all my life, study democratization and work for it against my own authoritarian regime in Spain, against authoritarian regi regimes in Latin America, against authoritarian regimes in the former Soviet Union, and uh, because of personal reasons. Obviously, those are all lessons that we should know. So the question is how, and I fully agree with you, that all these freedoms are interrelated. So the question is why this emphasis and sole emphasis on religious freedom and religious persecution. And this is sort of the question, what do we gain from it and what do we lose if we put the emphasis? I think we gain a lot. We gain a lot because precisely sometimes those are small minorities who simply do not appear on the, on the radar of many people or sometimes precisely because those are inconvenient minorities to many governments and they are silent. And so in this respect, I think it is, it is very important that we focus on religious persecution, religious minorities. But when you do it in a way that it appears as the sole story, it becomes somewhat problematic. And I will point this in the case studies itself. Now there are two, what is probably the greatest contribution, theoretical contribution of the book is that you point out that the pincers or the two social restrictions or societal restrictions and government restrictions. And it is the combination of the two and how they interfere that lead to very different types of persecution. And in this, the typology, I think, is very good, the six uh, types that you have precisely, and I think this is a very important contribution. The question is the typology that comes from numbers. And here, my second question about quantification. Again, you've done a great job. I think it's very important to do quantification because when you quantify, you can compare. But I have two questions about the quantification. One is absolute persecution numbers. Obviously, uh, if it is absolute, uh, China and India, anything they do, the numbers are going to be, even if it's only a very small proportion of the population, they are, are going to be, appear huge. While countries that have only two million people, uh, uh, if they have only 1%, they are going to appear very low. So the quantification itself here is a problem in how do you classify the countries. And it appears very clear. If you look at the six types, the list of countries, I mean, I look at the first list, let's, say, let's, let's look at the first list. It's, and obviously, most of the liberal democracies appear there in this very nice. You would expect the liberal democracies that have the rule of law uh, appear there, whether they have pluralistic religious economies or not. I mean, Ireland appears there as zero, 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 right? And yet it doesn't have, doesn't, doesn't, it's not a proof of, the, of your thesis of religious economies. I, I, I don't want to get into religious economies because obviously we, 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 we enter into a, a, a different question, a, a different discussion here. What I'm pointing out that the evidence there is not so much linked to religious economies. It's linked to freedoms denied. This is what, 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 what is there. But then you have a lot of countries that uh, uh, zero, and when you put together, when the Republic of Congo appears there as zero, you question, is it non-reported because we have no reports? Or is the Republic of Can Congo a country with no freedoms are denied? This is it a period of terrible violence in the country where you have all these armies from all over the other countries coming in and appears here as, 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 as one of the best countries in the world. Now, when I see this list of countries uh, putting together, and again, you have a lot of African countries which appear along with the most liberal democracies in the world, and I am concerned about the quant what does the quantification mean here? I think there's a typology that is based purely on these numbers. The numbers here obviously hide something or do not explain things 
because I know enough about these countries to see that those countries do not belong together. In the same way that Germany and Nigeria do not belong together. When you see the ger freedom, a, a, a book that is going to illustrate freedoms denied, that has Germany and Nigeria with very similar numbers, you know something is wrong with this technology. So I, I would urge you that you don't put all this uh, faith in numbers, uh, because then we are entering into questions. Germany, I'm going to give you an anecdotal. I happen to be the William James professor at Bayreuth University this summer, and then you become a, a civil servant of Bayern. So I had to sign all these documents that I have not belonged belong to three types of organizations. One where the ones you will expect from Germany, any neo-Nazi or any neo-communist, Stasi, etc. So this was the one list. The other list was a list of about probably 150 Muslim organizations, charity organizations, whether all of them were jihadists or not, anybody who gave money to Hamas appeared in the list as a terrorist link organization. It was very problematic also. We know why Tariq, Ram Tariq Ramadan couldn't get access or entry to the United States because he had given charity to organizations that gave money to Hamas. And third was Scientology. Obviously, there's something wrong with the German government that puts Scientology in the same category as, as, as neo-Nazis. Obviously, yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, French and Germans have an absolute nonsensical obsession with Scientology, not recognizing that it is a religion or not religion, but freedom of expression. So here it has to do with, with freedom of conscience, right? Um, so about quantification. Now let's go through the six cases because I, I like very much the fact that because history is crucial here. The problem with uh, a, a, a study like yours, which is a flat uh, study that puts together countries that have, may have 200 years of democracy and countries that are only struggling now to democratize, like, like Indonesia. I mean, if I look in Indonesia today, the kind of problems they have, they remind me of the problems that the United States had in the 1840s and 50s, when they were persecuting Mormons and persecuting Catholics. This is basically the situation. And because Mormons precisely were not considered like Ahmadiyyas, they were not considered Christians, and they were persecuted very by precisely the, the, the people, not the government. So again, the, the question here is that uh, that's why it's so important to have the case studies to indicate the dynamics of transformations. Because the question is, how do you get, if you go, I mean, to, to, to go back to the, to the very, very interesting quote from Voltaire that you have found, because it's I, I really fascinating, how do you go from you call the despotism of monopoly to the peace of plurality? Of course, really, you don't need to the peace of plurality. What you need is to the peace of rule of law and uh, liberal democracy. This is what you need. How do you get to there? Whether in the process uh, you get plurality, you get plurality through freedom of conscience. And of course, this is a form of internal pluralization, even when you have uh, one single homogeneous religion, but you have within this religion an internal pluralization. This is what is at stake, not so much that you actually produce de facto pluralities. However, in the modern world, given the trends of the aspora's immigration, pluralities are being constituted everywhere. So the need then to protect these pluralities, and we see how even the most liberal European societies have difficulties incorporating these new uh, religions coming in. But yeah, let me give a, a brief, uh, how much, I don't want to take too much time, about the, the cases you have. Japan, of course, is the fantastic, uh, uh, happy ending story. But we know, we, and I think it's very good that you point to um, the, the, the persecution of the criminals, not of the whole sect. This is crucial. Obviously, we, we in the United States have not learned to do that frequently. Every time we went to war, we persecuted Germans in World War I, we persecuted Japanese in World War II, not criminals, but those who somehow were by association. And we have restricted the liberties of, of Muslims uh, and, and their rights and their civil liberties after the war on terror. So in this respect, I think that it is very important that you put Japan. But of course, we know that uh, the cost, the initial costs were very great. If to get rid of emperor cult, you have to drop bombs, atomic bombs, so that you, I mean, we have to recognize that it is a success story because the cost of forcing the Japanese to have democracy were really terrible. Uh, again, but it is a very happy ending. And precisely because you point to the fact that they learn how to do it in a way that, for instance, Europeans do not learn how to do it today with Muslim terrorists, right? Because then we, we go to all the Muslims. And um, the second story, um, Brazil. 
Again, what happens when you look at plurality? When you missed the period of the greatest, the most violent persecution of religious people in Brazilian history were the 60s and 70s during the authoritarian regimes when they persecuted and killed priests and nuns and Catholic groups that were fighting for the democracy of all. Indeed, not for the rights of the Catholic Church, for the democracy of all. But this story is not here, does not appear, and is the key for the success story that you are. So the ones that defended the rights of, not necessarily the rights of Protestants, but the ones that made it possible was, of course, the Catholics that fought for democratization. And um, India. Of course, India is a very, very special case. Special case, but on the one hand, is the greatest story of a country where democracy should not work at all. Hundreds of languages, hundreds of religions, hundreds of, I mean, the inequalities, and yet it works somehow. Of course, with cost, and the communal cost. But proportionally, again, I would, if you compare Pakistan and India, I mean, the, you cannot put them in the same category. Of course, you don't do because you see that the government. So their question is rule of law. It's not only a question of government giving freedoms, but can the governments protect the rule of law? I mean, themselves. And, and sometimes the question here is that you have governments that are not strong enough, if you wish, the central government in, in India, to precisely protect people from others. And it's not so much, I wouldn't argue, the Hindu majority is Hindu minorities, who are actually not Hindus, because they are not religious people. So it's not really, they are ideologies, minorities that mobilize the ideology of the Hindu majority. Again, majorities and minorities, of course, are form. They are not facts. There was no Hindu majority before the mobilization against the, the British. There was no Muslim. Those things were formed in the process of mobilization. And of course, these books are the ones that form majorities and minorities by counting them. And this is the process through which these things are also constituted. Um, uh, Iran. Obviously, Iran is a terrible case. The persecution of Baha'is is really, really appalling. But of course, you only have one sentence about uh, the fact that the freedoms of the majority of citizens is denied because the government. So the freedoms denied in Iran are the freedoms denied of those Muslims who are fighting for democratization. And this doesn't appear in the book. So the, the crucial story of Iran, of course, Baha'is is very important. But the crucial story is the fact you had a society fighting for democratization that has been crushed. And that, uh, uh, and that again, is not so much here issue of religious persecution. Uh, I think that if you only look from the perspective of a religion, you are going to miss part of the story you want to tell. So it has to be put precisely along with all other freedoms. And so the question is how to advance uh, uh, rule of law, democracy, and the protections of the rights, the individual rights of majorities and minorities and everybody. Okay. Um, just a few things I'll, I'll comment on. Um, one, in terms of as far as with uh, the quantitative part, as far as absolute numbers or, or essentially rate, is it on? This one's working. Okay. Trade. Okay. The first question, as far as the quantitative question about absolute numbers or rates, and I think that that's that's a very important, obviously. Um, what we have done as far as in the analysis, that model I put up there, we did control for population. I mean, it was a control variable in there which helps to control for that. When we were actually presenting numbers as far as in some other spots, as far as in the paper, we probably did actually use actual numbers. Um, 
you know, I'm always embarrassed when I require my students to make sure their cell phones are off and then mine goes off. It's really an embarrassing thing. So, yeah. um, so I, I think that's a you know, very good point. We did try to do that in the full model then where we did control for that. In terms of the absence of reporting, I absolutely agree. I mean, one of the things that, that we said in the book was that uh, while some people are going to find it hard to believe that the level of persecution is, it, the persecution is really as high as we're reporting, in fact, the level of persecution is much higher than what we're reporting. What we reported on was when it was, it was in the reports, the existence of it in the reports. Obviously, in many countries, uh, p very few, if anyone, is going to have access to the actual numbers occurring. You're not going to have press coverage. Numbers. So, so we, we agree. I mean, there's, there's an undercount there. And now the, the concern we have, which I think is the same concern that Jose is mentioning, to what extent is that uh, undercount systematic? So I mean, he pointed out Africa, which is a good example. And that always is a concern. I think uh, the one thing we did to try to, uh, to calm our fears in that regard, if you will, uh, which was in a paper we did earlier, was we did it by regions. So to see if that relationship held by regions, and it did which gave us more confidence for the relationship as a whole when you go across regions. But I think when you actually talk about levels of persecution, this is clearly low, okay? So it's clearly higher than what we're reporting. And I, I completely agree with that. We, we mentioned in the book, but you might miss that one sentence, you know how this goes. So anyway, yeah. And then uh, in regards to the other thing, I want to be real clear as far People as with- People are only going to look at the tables. So yeah, that's right. Tables. Yeah, yeah. They, uh, yeah, they always say the quantitative people only read the tables and, you know, the qualitative people only read the text. And so you, you have to put it in both, yeah. So, uh, yeah, in regard to uh, the, the whole issue of pluralism, I, I want to be real clear on that. Uh, the one thing we're arguing is we're not arguing, in some earlier stuff with religious economies, we had pluralism as, as a driving variable. Here we, we don't. In fact, what we're saying is regulation. And so it's the restrictions as far as on those rights. As far as the diff different individual cases, I really don't have many concerns or problems. I mean, I'm sure we did overlook some, some key things, in particular with Brazil. I do think that is a, was a key time in history in the 50s and 60s because that was, it's very interesting to look at some of the case studies that were done around that time too because they were estimating what religious minorities were going to be like in future years and they were way, way underestimating it because they didn't account for the fact that these groups would be successful in gaining greater freedoms. So um, I, I think there's certainly some truth there. and. And, you know, some of them, you know, in terms of what we emphasize, obviously, you know, it's like anything else. You can only tell so many stories at one time. So we tried to tell stories that we hoped would illustrate our main points. And, you know, I'm sure there are other stories could have been and should have been told, too. Now, in regard to the government, one thing I really want to stress, too, is, is um, we got into this a little bit in the book, but governments both, you know, I think you had three things you listed as far as the rule of government, uh, the rule of law. Uh, what was the other two? Yeah. Democracy, yeah. But then, but the, I mean, see, with a rule of law, you have yeah. ma the theory of the majority. Yeah, and one of the things with uh, some work we're looking at now is as far as essentially just have to find out is the government able and is the government willing as far as to protect freedoms? And so in order to find that out, you know, you have to look at indicators such as to what extent is the government functioning in a capacity and it, it can enforce sanctions, you know? So as far as from a legislative side, from an enforcement side, can enforce that. But equally important is to what extent do religious groups have, uh, or any group, as far as for their, their freedoms, th they have a second option. Essentially, are the, are the courts available? Are the courts effective? You know, one of the things, India's courts are way heavily overburdened. Uh, but do the, you know, do the courts, do they, one, do they operate as an independent judiciary, or are they under, under some, under, operating under some sort of religious law? And then two, are they operating effectively? You know, uh, are they capable of doing what you want to ha have done? And so I think that um, those are really central issues when we talked about the importance of, of trying to explain um, religious freedoms. Because this time we were looking at freedom's influence on religious persecution. Taking a step back in our model, we in part looked at what are the factors that explain religious freedom. But as we mentioned for future research, that's an area we really need to understand more fully. You know, when are governments able and willing as far as to, to really support these freedoms. And I think that's a real crucial question for the future. Yeah. I, thank you again, Jose, for your yeah. comments. Yeah. That, that was very, very helpful to us. Um, now, one, one note on the time frame. And I, in our case studies, we tried to go back in time. And I think you're exactly right that we missed some of the context uh, that was happening in countries. And I think the next book then will, 
we'll have that. Um, one, it's always our problem. Yeah, we do have an <laughs> appendix that we did a model over time, and that was a five-year time period. So, so that five-year time period was was. Com yes, I know. We when when uh, we have different ideas on time period, but I think that's that's exactly right. And one one of the uh, I think it. it things we tried to look at in the case of China. You didn't mention that too much. Yeah, but, uh, but I think we, we went through China and looked at its historic regulation of religion, yeah, going back in time, and that the current Chinese government is just following the pattern that, that was there. And maybe that, that particular case study came closer to what the ideal would be. Um, another idea on the time period and, and how it is reflected in the measures is the idea of Germany being in the, in the same category of Nigeria. And I'll say two things to that. Um, during the time period when we were coding, and that's reflected in the book, uh, German uh, labor law was such that if someone belonged to the Church of Scientology, that they had to be specifically marked on their labor uh, records that they're a member. So they were being designated. Now, th that doesn't you know, if you take the historical context of Germany, that was very troubling. You know, next thing they're going to be having to wear a I patch. I refuse to sign the form for the Bible. I forced them not to need to sign the form, the state of Bible, because I wouldn't sign it because I so yes. I thought it was put together with the Nazis, and I cannot sign this document. Yeah. So in, in some ways, that, that, that problem makes N Germany and Nigeria very different and un not able to be compared. But with the history, then there is a gravity to that, that policy in the German. Now, the other thing that, thinking of time and on the shorter term, is that in the research that I've been continuing at Pew on this, we've seen a substantial increase from the period of the book uh, in social hostilities involving religion in Nigeria. And so now Nigeria has moved, and China, and so Nigeria has actually moved out of the category with Germany and up into the category with India. What I was missing the Nigeria case is Yoruba. Yoruba is the part of Nigeria where all religions coexist peacefully together, a lot of intermarriage. Yes. It would be interesting the comparing Yoruba in Nigeria with the other, because Yoruba is really special. You're right. You have Muslims, Christians, and African religions, and Christians were Catholics and only evangelicals, yeah. and relatively peaceful. Right. The most peaceful part of Nigeria. So this would be a very important uh, uh, part for your story. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. All right. We're going to open up to questions at this point in time. Anything from the floor? Yes. <laughs> a, hot, a hot topic. Yeah. Um, after, uh, in our book, we don't uh, have a case study on Israel, and we actually don't uh, elaborate on the situation in Israel. Uh, in the Pew report, I could say something from there. We actually uh, have called out Israel as having um, high government restrictions on religion and very high social hostilities involving religion. And uh, th to some that may seem like a criticism, but I think that it's a, uh, it's, you know, it, it, there, there's some actual facts involved with the case. Uh, if you're, for instance, if you're a, not an Orthodox Jew, you can't marry unless you're married. So many non-Orthodox have to go out to Cyprus to marry. Um, there are other restrictions uh, that, and policies that are carried out, such as enforcing uh, no, non-construction of mosques in areas that aren't uh, certified for that construction and then the government will bulldoze um, structures that have been made. Um, so I, I won't go into the list of you know how it, it scores on that level. Um, but I think that one of the hopes is that these kinds of numbers, and numbers have a positive and negative side, uh, allow countries to be able to look at the situation from someone else's perspective. And, and granted, we might not have the, the perfect perspective and we miss things, um, but maybe Turkey is a, an example of how they've reacted to these numbers. Uh, in our first report at Pew, which followed the work uh, that I did at Penn State, Turkey came out as high on both government restrictions and social hostilities. 
in our next report, countries like China increased, Nigeria increased, France increased, uh, but Turkey didn't increase. And then there was a headline news in Turkey's uh, English Daily saying, good news, Turkey didn't increase <laughs> in its restrictions. Um, so the Kurds, if you were looking at Kurds, Kurd violence against Kurds and the violence, the cycle of violence, obviously, yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, it's still bad. It's still, I won't say bad. It's still. The religious part has improved. Yes. Yes. The religious part is. So uh, that's, that's the hope that these, these types of statistics and this kind of analysis um, can provide some discussion. Something else on this room? Yeah. Okay. Um, the obvious. No, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, so in, in the uh, study we did for the book, we looked at uh, government restrictions that came both from laws uh, as well as policies of the government towards religion in general. So we didn't specifically look at institutional religious freedom, but that would be implicit in whether or not the laws protect religious uh, freedom and the Constitution does. Uh, as well as policies. So we measured whether or not the government was taking actions to curb certain types of religious activities, which are usually carried out by organizations. So it would have both the personal side and the organizational side. And a quick way to, to get this information as well, too, is obviously in Pew Form, you have reports as far as on the, the methodology there. And if you go to uh, the arta.com, the, the website, which I have some brochures, if you forget the address, but. Um, when you go to national profiles and you look at individual nations, we give a list of the questions that were asked. Um, so uh, you can look there as well, too. So we try to be very transparent with that, yeah. Yes? Hi, um, Mr. Rochester. Um, you mentioned that the Yeah, as far as with the, the best sort of information or data in that area, Jonathan Fox has gone to great detail as far as trying to, to code out differently as far as which um, discrimination is, distinguishes between um, if it's a target for a religion, if it's a target for religions as a whole because it's an attempt to secularize, secularize or if it's a target to reduce the number of competitors. So he's... Uh, He's taken that out. Now that we have individual questions, and I think Brian might have expanded on this with Pew, where individual questions do address that. Individual questions ask that. As in terms of the indicators we used, um, they would not have that per se. So I w you could look at individual questions in the data files, which again are available at the ARDA. Uh, Jonathan Fox has even more detailed data as far as um, both in terms of level of discrimination, but how, if it's coming from majority to minority, or, or the relationships between the, the two groups that way as well. Could you say what the Fox data is? And the Fox data is also on the Arta.com as well. Yeah. And he will have a new data set coming out here within a year, I think. So on, on that question, we have experimented at Pew with the question asking whether or not uh, there are attempts to keep uh, religion from having a public voice in society. And uh, we're still analyzing those data and, and may have a, a report on that in the future. But right now, I, it's too early to say what the results are.
additional Sharia regulations on things like blasphemy interact with the codification of law in, in a modern state. I'm wondering, could you comment a little bit on how, how you see sort of untangling some of those things in, in a way that minimizes violence rather than comes at it from merely a sort of ideological existence that they immediately, you know, for whatever reason, human rights or whatever, just uh, abandon these laws. I mean, obviously there's going to need to be some tempering in the process. Right. <laughs> well, if I had the answer, <laughs> I certainly would have said more about it. But um, I, I guess the one thing I would say is, um, as I mentioned, one of the areas that, that you know, we have the the one chapter where we try to address some as far as what about the, the Muslim countries. So we, we try to address it some there. But I think in addition to that, you point to an important issue as far as uh, with the courts, you know, and to what extent are the courts independent of religious law? And here, they're not. I mean, they, and are they, are they independent of the state totally, you know? And in some cases, they're more or less independent of the state. So how you do it, um, I don't think I have an easy solution. But I, I think you're, you're tapping, you're, you're looking at the right area. You know, you're looking at the right area as far as how do we ensure, how can you ensure freedoms if the very law is against those freedoms, you know, and, and the courts are not behind the freedoms that might be promised in a constitution. And, and that's very problematic. So I, I don't know, if you're looking for the easy answer, I, I don't have one. If, if, if I may. Please. Uh, yes, yes, a suggestion. Obviously, if we look at the happy stories within the Muslim world, Senegal, Indonesia, despite the numbers, obviously it's a very, very happy story, and even Turkey, one could say uh, internal pluralization, not pluralities of religion, but in, it is when you have internal pluralization within Islam and you have groups within Islam which are different and protect each other and all of them from any minority imposing their view of Islam through the state. So you have the largest Muslim organization in the world, in Indonesia, that they are organized also, they are leaders politically, but they don't want to, to turn the organizations into political parties. And the whole point is not to turn the state law into Sharia, precisely to protect the pluralities of forms of Islam within Indonesia. And Senegal is the same thing. It is the, the ones that protect laicite in Senegal are the Muslim, the Murids, the Tamiya, the different Sufi brotherhoods to protect them and each other from anybody imposing a form of Islam. So here, it's basically, it's a change of attitude, obviously, besides uh, uh, the rule of law, obviously, and democracy, etc. But I think that this is, when talking of plurality, as important as pluralities of religion, because of course, ob in Protestantism, this is what denominationalism means. But you don't need internal denominationalism within Islam. You can still have one single Islam, and yet, which is internally pluralistic. And so the question is, how do you protect internal pluralism within Islam? This, I think, is the real, real question. Yeah, and I, and I would say, uh, as Brian and I point out in the book, too, as far as when it comes to uh, persecution, the, the groups that are most likely to be persecuted are often Islamic groups within Islamic countries, you know, so, so it gets right to that, you know, that very point. Yeah. Yes? I'm wondering, this is actually echoing Professor Casanova's question earlier, so if you can answer it, I just missed it. But I'm wondering why religious freedom, say, given that they are, that democratic freedoms are interrelated. Um, I study it quite a bit myself, and I suspect that there's something special about religious freedom, and yet every time I try to figure out why that is. So if you have any thoughts, I would appreciate it. Go ahead. I mean, just the, a couple things that you know, I would say is um, w w one thing to, to realize is when you compare it to many other freedoms, quite often they don't have an organizational component. Um, you know, so one of the things the state is concerned about is how do we control these organizations? You know, so when, uh, while other freedoms, you, know, you still have the press, you still have you know, women's rights, you have all these, but they often don't come with quite as large of organization, which wants to make some sort of alliance with the state. And so there's some complications there. And then the other thing is, um, Religion is is proven very effective in mobilizing populations, you know, historically, and 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 so it it is more of a, a threat both internally and and uh, both across religions and then to the state as well too. So, uh, but it has proven very effective that way, and it comes armed with already well mobilized organizations. 
I think ad adding to that is that religion was thought for many years to be a, a dying phenomenon, that it would shrink to, Roger could speak at length on this, but um, thought that it would retreat to the private sphere and, and lose its public relevance uh, was the theory. And as we look at the world today, we found that that theory didn't quite pan out. So that, I mean, that's another aspect of the nature of religion that may be different than some other types of social phenomenon, that it, it has an enduring quality that goes from generation to generation, uh, even on the institutional level, the longest lived institution is probably the, the Holy See and uh, as, as a, a coherent organization. So both beliefs and religious organizations endure uh, long beyond governments as well. May I, may I add something what is special about religion? It's obviously freedom of conscience. And that's why I will extend it to freedom of conscience in general. If I look at the Gulag and who was there in prison, there was, they were pre, we call them prisoners of conscience. Some of them were religious, others were simply they wanted to think differently than what the uh, uh, totalitarian regime wanted them to think. So it has to do with protecting the freedom of conscience as the most fundamental uh, uh, human right from which all other freedoms, if you wish, derive. Then freedom of conscience means freedom of assembly, and therefore freedom of religious organization, freedom of speech, and therefore so. But it is the fundamental character of freedom of conscience, which I argue is what makes uh, uh, freedom of religion so central. I'll say a couple things. One is that the project has some value in continuing doing what it's doing. So the, the fact that we've been able to track changes over time in the short term, uh, for instance, the increase in government restrictions in, in uh, France, uh, now provides some information that those that are concerned about the situation in France can then take and then bring to the attention of, of those in France and, and maybe others that are concerned about France. So just monitoring the trends is important and just like the trend I mentioned in, in Germany where Scientologists were really labeled uh, for uh, discrimination, that even marking what changes and, and, and drawing attention to it has intrinsic value. So I think one of the, the, the uh, things that is down the road is to keep doing this. Um, the other thing that, that Roger talked about at the end of his, uh, at the end of the slideshow was trying to disentangle a bit how uh, religious freedom relates to other social outcomes. And that's not very well understood. I think for many religious people, you just say, well, religion's good for society, and they say, well, yeah. But if you talk to people who aren't religious, they, and you say religion's a dangerous to society, they'll say, well, obviously. So, you know, you really have differing views on how religion, uh, you know, contributes to the, to the betterment or, or the detriment of society. So I think more research on that is, is needed. Yeah, I, I would just say that, the, you know, the two things that mentioned or that Brian mentioned as far as understanding the relationship to other freedoms, the other two that I mentioned would, would be as far as trying to really understand um, what ensures religious freedoms. I think that's an absolutely crucial question. We've taken sort of the initial steps, but there's a lot more steps that can be done there. And then um, as far as understanding the relationship to other conflicts. But I would also say um, that both with what Brian is doing at the Pew Forum as well as uh, what we've done at the, the ARDA as far as with disseminating this data is what we also want to do is simply enable others to, do, to work with this. Um, because these data files are readily downloadable now. Uh, they can be used uh, where the Pew Forum is collecting data over time. Jonathan Fox has collected some data over time. It really now opens it up as far as for a much larger, and it's based on the number of articles I get to review on this topic, I think just having the data available alone is going to open up beyond just Brian, myself, and a handful of others. We're really going to have a much larger community engaging in this research, and that's part of both with the book, with what we're arguing here, but also by making the data readily available, uh, what we hope to enable is really a much larger community to discuss and, and to test out some ideas here, too. Sir, 
there's one more hand. We're going to take that last question, and then I'm going to allow the three speakers to have any parting, brief parting shots, <laughs> and we'll conclude for today. So, ma'am. My name is Anita Durani from Voice of America. We have programs for Afghanistan. Of course, my question is about the Taliban. The way they uh, they uh, claim that they are very, um, they are Muslim and they are doing everything uh, behind the name of Islam. Do you give uh, them um, liberty as an Islam, or do we have to do something about them uh, to to just uh, prevent them to not use the name of Islam? Because Islam is a beautiful religion and in a complete religion, but the way they uh, use the name of Islam is not the way Islam says. Do you have some program to just open the name of the real Islam and open the, the way they do use the name of Islam and uh, just, just, just to give the bad name to, of Islam? Because the way, when, when they say, is somebody asks me, are you Muslim? I say yes. Immediately they say, oh, and see? Because they know everything about the Muslim, they, they say that I'm a, I'm, I belong to some groups or this and that. Isn't it the, the time to open up uh, the real Islam and just uh, give more information about Islam and just give more information about the Taliban, the way they do, and to give them more information. And do you have some problems in this uh, thing that you have? Yeah, we we actually do research and don't do programs. So uh, on that level, no, we don't have any programs to address the issues you're talking about. But I, I think that one thing that is clear from the data is that the world is globalizing and religion is globalizing. So people of faith are moving. Are you, are you from Afghanistan? Yes. So you're here, but 30 years ago, there were very few, if any, people coming from, from Afghanistan to here. So as, as the world globalizes, there will be an impact of different Muslim voices uh, in, in the dialogue um, uh, about uh, the Taliban or any Muslim community. So no, no program to offer, but maybe part of the benefits of you know, living in societies where you can express yourself is that th those voices can travel beyond here uh, you know, through the internet, through connections. Yeah, I really don't have much to add. I mean, um, we don't do programs either, but um, I, I guess with our model, what, what we would argue for is that for groups such as the Taliban, when you have uh, religious freedoms that are strictly enforced, um, it would not allow uh, groups to try to make an alliance with the state, to try to take over certain areas, uh, you know, politically. And obviously that assumes a lot about how well the state is operating. So. Um, so I think when you emphasize as far as getting information out, I mean, I think that's the very thing that religious groups do well when they're all playing on a level playing field, um, when uh, none of them have any form of an alliance with the state, and, and when they really have the freedoms to get their information out. So I would you know, argue wholeheartedly for the freedoms for everybody to get their information out. Um, and, and I certainly sympathize with you in terms of uh, you know, the perceptions that some people would have about Islam. But um, I know, and again, when I was doing the interviews in the Dearborn area, that was the thing that the imams kept s stressing over and over again. Our number one job is we have educational times for the public. So we open it up so they can learn more about us. And that was their way of addressing that. Last comments from the panel? I mean, I, in relation to that, uh, again, uh, there are two issues. One is the issue of organizing rule of law, democracy, etc. The other issue is internal pluralization of Islam. You said Islam, the true Islam. But you will have 10 Muslims, and all 10 of them will have a different vision of what the true Islam is. So the question is, how do we create the situation in which the many forms of Islam can live together peacefully? So that you don't have groups like Taliban that want to impose their view of Islam on other Muslims. So this is the, this is the, the task, and this is a task, I think, for all Muslims. It's not only for uh, uh, certainly external 
uh, powers cannot do much about it. So it has to be an internal transformation within Islam where Muslims themselves protect each other from minorities that are going to impose uh, uh, the view of Islam on them, on the majority. So, but it, it's, a, it's happening in Indonesia, it's happening in Senegal, it's happening in Turkey, and hopefully it will happen in more Muslim countries. Well, I guess the only thing I would just say, I, I uh, know that this is an audience either that has interest in research in the area or has been very influential in, in terms of uh, both the legislation as well as the collection of data in this area. And I would really say that, that it's, it's a, a very you know, crucial time to continue to get information in the area, to continue to do research in the area. And while I think you know, Brian and I will continue to work hard in this area, I really do stress, and maybe it's perhaps my age where I'm getting, you know, but is uh, it's really crucial that we get a larger community understanding uh, where this research can and should go, but then also how it fits in with a, a larger agenda of, of freedoms in, in well, as well, too. Because I think too often it's been taken as, uh, you know, this side area that's very different than other freedoms, and I think we need to make it very clear how it fits in with the other other freedoms as well. Um, I think what this book has hopefully done is helped to document the case for the lack of freedoms and the high level of persecution, but there's still uh, so much more that a much larger research community needs to do. And I, I'd just like to thank Jose and Eric and Tom and the Berkeley Center for hosting this, and, and you're, this center and these scholars here are dedicated to the very thing of trying to understand these things better. So we're very pleased that we could come and we hope it's uh, offered some insights that help help your project along as well. So thank you. Thank you to you for having written yeah. this book, having put so much effort and love into the book. Thank you. So five very brief final shots. The first one is about the Taliban. If you don't mind, my, I'm gonna chime in on this one. What's interesting about that, so much about what this book is about is the relationship of religious freedoms to, as Jose keeps hint, saying, the rule of law and then other freedoms. The Taliban arose due to corruption and violence within their own society. I mean, the fundamental moment when the Taliban essentially begins is when Mullah Omar goes out and hangs the local checkpoint operator who was basically forcing people to pay a toll just one mile from his home. And then what does he do? He goes t to mile three, where there's another checkpoint. You know, Afghanistan in the 90s was run like the mafia, and the common people were extorted. And it's just it should remind us that what the Taliban blended, at least early on, was a extreme desire for order with a religious sentiment, and it was the breakdown of the state, breakdown of individual security, et cetera, that promoted the rise. And so the flip side of the coin are many of these positive values associated with, within the rule of law, individual freedom. The Taliban was actually acting, not, not towards freedom, but towards individual security in that sense. And that, that's a part of this that's, I think, often missed in the conversation. Second thing, is, is that many of you came because you got an, a, an email invitation. I would just direct you to many of the resources of the Religious Freedom Project that are on the Berkeley Center website, and you can sign up for our mailing list right there on the, at the bottom of that front page of the website. Third, Tom invited you to the next RFP event. That's on November 17th here on the Georgetown campus. The full details of that, again, are on the website. And then the last thing I'd mention on behalf of the authors is they did bring some books that they would love to sell you. They might even autograph them. Hopefully they'll autograph mine. And uh, Kyle, I think, will help us with actually the transaction. And you can do that right up here at the front and greet them at the end. So in closing, thanks to our staff who've been behind the scenes, like Kyle, Aaron, and others who've made this possible. And would you help me in thanking our speakers today? <laughs>